Lesson 7 for February 9 through to 15, The Seven Trumpets. Sabbath afternoon, February 9. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are reading through the book of Revelation at the moment, and we're finding there the, the story of Jesus. We're also finding the story of what happens to this earth as time progresses. And as we do so, we just thank you for the assurance that our salvation is based in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that each of us, through faith, can have salvation. Please be with us this week. May your Holy Spirit guide and bless each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Let's read that again, Revelation 10 verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. In the scene of the fifth seal, we saw that the cry of God's oppressed people reflects the cry of the faithful of all ages. These faithful ones were portrayed as souls under the altar, crying to God for justice and vindication, saying, How long, O Lord? in Revelation chapter 6 verse 10. The voice from heaven urged them to wait, because the day was coming when God would judge those who harmed them. Revelation 6, 15-17 pictures Jesus returning to this earth and bringing judgment upon those who did evil to his faithful followers. Revelation 6, beginning at verse 15, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? The scene of the fifth seal represents the experience of God's suffering people throughout history. From the time of Abel until the time when God will finally judge and avenge the blood of his servants, as in Revelation 19 verse 2, God's suffering people must remain firm and believe that God hears the prayers of his people. The vision of the seven trumpets shows that throughout history, God already has intervened on behalf of his oppressed people and has judged those who harmed them. The purpose of the seven trumpets is to assure God's people that heaven is not indifferent to their suffering. Sunday, February 10, The Prayers of the Saints Revelation 8 opens with a picture of seven angels standing before God, ready to blow their trumpets. Before the trumpets are blown, another scene is inserted. Its purpose is to explain the theological meaning of the trumpets. Read Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, along with the description of the daily services in the temple in Jerusalem given below. I'll actually read Revelation 8, 3 to 5, because that comes up further in today's lesson. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. A Jewish commentary on the Bible explains that at the evening sacrifice the lamb was placed upon the altar of burnt offering, and the blood was poured out at the base of the altar. An appointed priest took the golden censer inside the temple and offered incense on the golden altar in the holy place. When the priest came out, he threw the censer down on the pavement, producing a loud noise. 
At that point, seven priests blew their trumpets, marking the end of the temple services for that day. One can see how the language of the evening service is used in Revelation 8, 3-5, which we've just read. It is significant that the angel receives incense at the golden altar which was before the throne in verse 3. The incense represents the prayers of God's people, as we read in Revelation 5, verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Their prayers are now being answered by God. Revelation 8, 3-5 provides important information regarding the trumpets in Revelation. The seven trumpets are God's judgments on rebellious humanity in response to the prayers of his oppressed people. The trumpets follow the death of Jesus as the Lamb and run consecutively throughout history until the second coming. Revelation 11, verses 15-18 to 18. Then the seventh angel sounded... And there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Revelation chapter 8 verse 5 and Ezekiel 10 verse 2. How does Ezekiel's vision of hurling fire upon apostate Jerusalem elucidate the nature of the trumpets in Revelation? Revelation 8 verse 5, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And Ezekiel 10 verse 2, Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in among the wheels, under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in, as I watched. The angel fills the censer with fire from the altar, and hurls it down to the earth. Significantly, this fire comes from the very altar on which the prayers of the saints were offered. The fact that the fire comes from that very altar shows that the seven trumpet judgments fall upon the inhabitants of the earth in answer to the prayers of God's people, and also that God will intervene in their behalf in his appointed time. The throwing down of the censer also may be a warning that Christ's intercession will not last forever. There will be a close of probationary time. As we read in Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Monday, February 11. The Meaning of the Trumpets In portraying God's interventions on behalf of his people, Revelation uses the imagery of trumpets in the Old Testament. Trumpets were an important part of the daily life of ancient Israel. As we see in Numbers 10, verses 8 to 10, The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, 
gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over the burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. And Second Chronicles 13, verses 14 and 15. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear, and they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Their sound reminded people of the worship in the temple. Trumpets also were blown in battle, at harvest time, and during festivals. Blowing trumpets went hand in hand with prayer. During worship in the temple, or during the festivals, the trumpets reminded God of His covenant with His people. They also reminded people to be ready for the day of the Lord, as it said in Joel 2 verse 1. During battle, the trumpet sound gave key instructions and warnings, and called upon God to save His people. This concept is the backdrop for the trumpets in Revelation. Question. Read Revelation chapter 8 verse 13 and Revelation 9 verses 4 and 20 and 21. Who are the objects of the judgments of the seven trumpets? Revelation 8 verse 13. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And Revelation 9, verse 4, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And verses 20 and 21, But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor work, and they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. The events triggered by the trumpets in Revelation denote God's intervention in history in response to the prayers of His people. While the seals concern primarily those who profess to be God's people, the trumpets herald judgments against the inhabitants of the earth, as we read in Revelation 8 and verse 13. At the same time, They are warnings for those who dwell on the earth to bring them to repentance before it is too late. The seven trumpets cover the course of events from John's time until the conclusion of this earth's history in Revelation 11 verses 15 to 18. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. They are blown while intercession goes on in heaven, and the gospel is being preached on earth. Revelation 8, verse 3 to 6. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And Revelation 10 verse 8 through to chapter 11 verse 14. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. 
And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter, and he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven, saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The judgments of the trumpets are partial. They affect only one third of creation. The seventh trumpet announces that the time has arrived for God to assume his rightful rule. The seven trumpets apply approximately to the same periods covered by the seven churches and the seven seals. A. The first two trumpets herald judgments upon the nations that crucified Christ and persecuted the early church, rebellious Jerusalem and the Roman Empire. B. The third and fourth trumpets portray heaven's judgment against the apostasy of the Christian church in the medieval period. C. The fifth and sixth trumpets describe the warring factions in the religious world during the late medieval and post-reformation periods. These periods are characterized by increasing demonic activity that ultimately draws the world into the battle of Armageddon. And so to finish today, no question, history is bloody and full of pain and sorrow. How should this sad reality help us realise just how wonderful what we have been promised through Jesus really is? Tuesday, February 12, The Angel with an Open Book The sixth trumpet brings us to the time of the end. What are God's people called to do during this time? Before the seventh trumpet sounds, an interlude is inserted, explaining the task and experience of God's people at the end time. Read Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through to 4. What is happening here? I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. 
He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ, Ellen White writes in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971. He places his feet on the sea and the land, signifying his universal rule, and that what he is about to proclaim has worldwide significance. He shouts with the roar of a lion. A lion's roar symbolizes God's voice, as we see in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 10. They shall walk before the Lord. He will roar like a lion when he roars. Then his sons shall come trembling from the west. And Revelation 5 and verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. John is not allowed to write down what the thunders have said. There are things concerning the future that God has not revealed to us through John. Question. Read Revelation chapter 10, verses 5 through to 7. Compare this passage with Daniel 12, verses 6 and 7. What words do they have in common? Revelation 10, beginning at verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. And comparing that with Daniel 12, verses 6 and 7, And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfilment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives for ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. When the angel states that there will be time no longer, in Revelation 10 verse 6, the Greek word chronos shows that he refers to a period of time. This points back to Daniel 12, 6 and 7, where an angel states the persecution of the saints will last for a time, times and half a time, or 1,260 years. A.D. 538 to 1798, during which the church was persecuted by the papacy. And we'll compare that with Daniel 7.25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Since in Daniel and Revelation a prophetic day symbolizes a year, as uh, we see in Ezekiel 14.34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6, 360 days equals 360 years, and three and a half times or years equals 1,260 days or years. Let's look at those verses. Numbers 14 verse 34, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. And Ezekiel 4 verse 6, And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Sometime after this prophetic period, the end would come. 
The statement that time will be no longer refers to the time prophecies of Daniel, particularly the 2,300 prophetic days of Daniel 8.14, from 457 BC to AD 1844. That text reads, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. After this period, there no longer will be prophetic time periods. Ellen White states in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971, This time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there shall be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. And so to finish today, what does this statement from Ellen White tell us about why we must avoid all future date setting? Wednesday, February 13, Eating the Scroll Read Revelation 10, 8-11 Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and I will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter, and he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Eating in the Bible is used to describe the acceptance of a message from God in order to proclaim it to the people, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8 through to chapter 3, verse 11. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go, speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly, and fill your stomach with this scroll that I gave you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and a hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and your foreheads strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house." Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you, and hear with your ears, and go, get to the captives, to the children of your people, and speak to them and tell them. Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear, or whether they refuse. And Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When received, the message is good news. But when it is proclaimed, it sometimes results in bitterness, as it is resisted and rejected by many. 
John's bittersweet experience in eating the scroll, representing the book of Daniel, is related to the unsealing of Daniel's end-time prophecies. John here represents God's end-time remnant church that is commissioned to proclaim the everlasting gospel at the close of Daniel's time prophecy, or 1,260 days. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 reads, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. And Daniel 7 verse 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into His hand for a time and times and half a time. The context indicate that John's vision points to another bittersweet experience at the conclusion of the prophetic 2,300-year period, when, on the basis of Daniel's prophecies, the Millerites thought that Christ would return in 1844, that message was sweet to them. However, When Christ did not appear as expected, they experienced a bitter disappointment and searched the scriptures for a clearer understanding. John's commission to prophesy again to the world points to Sabbath-keeping Adventists raised up to proclaim the message of the Second Coming in connection with the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Question read Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. What is John ordered to do. And that reads, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. This passage continues the scene of Revelation 10. John was commanded to measure the temple, the altar, and the worshippers. The concept of measuring in the Bible refers figuratively to judgment, as you read in Matthew 7 too. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The temple that was to be measured is in heaven, where Jesus ministers for us. The reference to the temple, the altar, and the worshippers point to the Day of Atonement, as we read in Leviticus 16, verses 16 to 19. So he shall make atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions, for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar all around." Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. This day was a day of measuring as God judged his people. Thus, Revelation 11.1 refers to the judgment that takes place prior to the second coming. This judgment concerns exclusively God's people, the worshippers in the temple. Revelation 11.1 shows that the heavenly sanctuary message lies at the heart of the final gospel proclamation, which includes the vindication of God's character. As such, it gives the full dimension of the gospel message regarding the atoning work of Christ and His righteousness as the only means of salvation for human beings. And so, to finish the day... Keeping in mind how central blood was to the Day of Atonement ritual, and we read about that in those verses from Leviticus chapter 16 a moment ago, how can we always keep before us the reality that the judgment is good news? 
Why is this truth so important? Thursday, February 14, The Two Witnesses Question, read Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 through to 6. In what ways do the two witnesses reflect Zerubbabel and Joshua in their royal and priestly roles? Revelation 11, beginning at verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues, as often as they desire. And Zechariah 4, verses 2 and 3. So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right hand of the bowl and the other at its left. And verses 11 to 17, 11 to 14. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. The idea of two witnesses comes from the Jewish legal system, which requires at least two witnesses to establish something as true. As we read in John chapter 8, verse 17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. The two witnesses represent the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments. The two cannot be separated. God's people are called to proclaim the full message to the world, the full Bible message to the world, the whole counsel of God, as it says in Acts 20, verse 17. The witnesses are pictured as prophesying in sackcloth during the prophetic period of 1,260 days or years, A.D. 538 to 1798. Sackcloth is the garment of mourning, as we read in Genesis thirty seven thirty four. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. It points to the difficult time when the truths of the Bible were buried and covered over by human traditions. Question. Read Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 13. In your own words, describe what happened to the two witnesses at the end of the prophetic 1,260 days or years. Revelation 11, beginning at verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, 
there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The beast that kills the two witnesses arises from the very abode of Satan. This killing of the witnesses applies historically to the atheistic attack on the Bible and the abolition of religion in connection with the events of the French Revolution. The anti-religious system established in France possessed the moral degradation of Sodom, the atheistic arrogance of Egypt and the rebelliousness of of Jerusalem. What happened to Jesus in Jerusalem now happens to the Bible by this anti-religious system. The resurrection of the witnesses points to the great revival of interest in the Bible in the aftermath of the French Revolution, which resulted in the rise of the Second Advent Movement with its restoration of Bible truth, the establishment of Bible societies, and the worldwide distribution of the Bible. Right before the end, the world will witness one final global Bible proclamation, as we read in Revelation 18 verses 1 through to 4. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. This final message will provoke opposition empowered by the demonic entities. Working miracles to deceive the world and draw worshippers of the beast into a final battle against God's faithful witnesses. See Revelation 16 verses 13 to 16 And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon and Revelation 14 Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friday, February 15. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 18 reads, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. These texts, the seventh trumpet, signals the conclusion of this earth's history. The time has come for God to reveal his power and to reign. This rebellious planet, which has been under the dominion of Satan for thousands of years, is about to come back under God's dominion and rule. 
It was after Christ's death on the cross and his ascension to heaven that Christ was proclaimed to be the legitimate ruler of the earth, as we read in Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Satan continues to wreak all the havoc he can, knowing that his time is short, as we read in verse 12. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. The seventh trumpet heralds that the usurping powers have been dealt with and that this world finally has come under Christ's rightful rule. The seventh trumpet outlines the content of the remainder of the book. 1. The nations were angry. Revelation chapter 12 through to chapter 14 describes Satan as filled with anger, as you read in 12.17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, who, with his two allies, the sea beast and the earth beast, prepares the nations of the world to fight against God's people. 2. Your wrath has come. God's answer to the anger of the nations is the seven last plagues, which are referred to as God's wrath in Revelation 15 verse 1. Then I saw another angel in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. 3. The time for the dead to be judged is described in Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And four, and to reward God's servants is portrayed in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. 5. To destroy those who destroy the earth. Revelation 19.2 states that end-time Babylon is judged because it destroyed the earth. Revelation 19 and verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. The destruction of Satan, his hosts and his two allies is the final act in the drama of the great controversy, as we read in Revelation 19, verse 11, through to chapter 20 and verse 15. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God." And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh." Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark, on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished." This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. At times we find that preaching the gospel can be a bitter experience, as we read in Revelation 10.10. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Our words are rejected and mocked, and we ourselves can be rejected and mocked. Sometimes preaching can even stir up opposition. What Bible characters can you think of who face such trials, and what can we learn from their experiences for ourselves? 2. Reflect on the following statement from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 188. Again and again have I been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. End of quote. What problems do you see with drafting overly detailed prophetic charts of the final events after 1844? How can one safeguard against the pitfalls that charts like these may bring?
Inside Story. Our story today is titled Missionary Changed My F, and it's by Eugene French. I was an average student in my theology class at Salusi College in pre independence Zimbabwe. My hardest subject was Greek, and the highest grade that I ever got in it was a C. When I wrote my final exam, I knew that I had failed. Doc, I failed again, I said as I handed it to the professor, Dr. Leo Ronio. He smiled and said, it's OK. For the next week, I mourned the fact that I couldn't graduate. I had planned to get married a month later, and the notion of spending another six months redoing Greek was unthinkable. Then Dr. Ronio, a retirement-age missionary born in Finland, called me into his office and I understood for the first time the meaning of God's grace. I've been watching you for four years on this campus, Dr. Ronio said. I've seen you change from a radical fellow to a hard-working young man who loves the Lord. I noticed that even the music on your tape recorder changed from rock and roll music to Christian music. I was surprised that he had observed something that no one else seemed to have noticed. You have done well on your other subjects and past, Dr. Ronio said, but you have battled with Greek. I know how much this graduation means to you in three weeks. I know you have done all you could to pass your Greek exam, but failed. Still, I want to give you grace, he said. I know the Lord has a plan for you in the work that you are going to do. By grace, I am going to give you a passing grade so you can graduate. Then he prayed for God to guide my future work. Little did I know how far God would take me. The Lord helped me to work for 18 years as Youth Ministries Director for the Adventist Church in Zimbabwe. After that, I served as Youth Director at the Church Division for seven years. I also received a doctorate in leadership. Every day I pray for God's help to extend grace to others, just as it was given to me. God sees potential in us, even in our lowest state of sin. He sees what we can accomplish once we're filled with His Spirit. We also should stop looking at the present and adopt God's eyes to see the future potential in others. And Eugene French, aged 61, is Associate Secretary with the Zimbabwe Union Conference based in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. Leo Ronio died at the age of 72 in 1984, three years after Eugene's graduation. Part of the 2015 13th Sabbath offering went to Seleucia University to double the size of its crowded cafeteria from 500 seats to 1,000. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide by Dr. Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. This service is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department and Christian Services for the Blind. Remember, God is always faithful.